So um, I have uh, the honor, I think, to give the last talk for this session. Um, you heard a lot of about what CP2K can do or what you can do directly with CP2K. Now in my talk, I will go a bit uh, beyond CP2K. So I will talk about um, how you can automate your calculations, um, how you can integrate CP2K with other projects or what are the other projects uh, you can use together with CP2K um, in case you have, you have um, uh, things you wanna do which are not covered here. Uh, I will also cover um, a bit about testing and verifying installations or doing an installation. Um, the outline is basically this. I will start with preparing CP2K just shortly. I mean, here you have an excellent uh, support which provides you with a, with a good installation of CP2K, but there might be, um, you might be at a job where you don't have that where you have to build it yourself, where you have to verify that what you did um, works, actually. And, um, or if you have to use a newer version than what is available currently on your system. Um, I will also show you how you, or what you probably should do when archiving calculations, how you can also debug your inputs. Now you had a lot of well done exercises which took away a lot of, of, of the details you have, um, uh, which pro problems which could show up when you modify the inputs. Um, there are some tricks um, to debug your input and to get, um, to get a working input file faster. There is, of course, also the possibility to generate input um, using some tools, or also if you have kind of like high throughput things or repeating configurations, configuration snippets in your input uh, on, on how to modularize your input mm -hmm. and make it more reusable. This is what, what this section will be about, this input generation. And then of course there are uh, ways on, on how to automate the, the runs. Uh, this starts from simple batch processing using, using scripts and I will not talk about this, I assume that you know how to do that, um, but I will show you uh, projects which allow you to completely automate workflows which include running CP2K calculations on a cluster, then doing analysis on that, and then continue from there, allowing you to track all the different steps in, in one uh, database, which allows you to, to publish this uh, later on. Um, sorry. Seems it's kept a bit far ahead. Well, I was pressing the wrong button. Okay. Now. Sorry. Uh, then I will talk about other projects um, here. This is the, the integration of PhonoPy, how to do uh, phono calculations, um, how to do um, transition path th sampling uh, for rare events using this Pyretis uh, project, just shortly as, a, as an idea. Uh, then I will uh, again mention IPy. Uh, then you heard about the basis sets, since CP2K is a Gaussian type orbital uh, based code, you have basis sets all the time to do your calculations. And at some point you have to select the proper one. Um, there are some guidelines on how to do that or some ideas. Um, I will go into that. And last but not least, when you maybe submit a project proposal, you have to show to the compute supercomputing center that your project scales um, to, the, to the nodes re re you requested. CP2K provides output there on to assess where your performance bottlenecks are. And, uh, We'll look at that shortly. Okay, well, when building CP2K, um, CP2K uses a lot of libraries, as you have already heard uh, from, from Jörg at, on Monday or also from uh, Marcella just before. Um, compiling CP2K and providing all these libraries might be tedious. Um, this is why we provide a toolchain script. It's called, it's a collection of shell scripts which build and provide all the required libraries to, to get 
a working CP2K installation. This works on Linux and Mac, it's supposed to work there, and it's quite easy once you get either the tarball for CP2K for the source code or if you get the source code from our Git repository, you can simply run, um, go to this toolchain script and run the toolchain. It does some auto detection and the only thing it assumes in the basic version, which you should have, is uh, a Fortran compiler and also MPI available. So it tries to use an available MPI um, library uh, plus make plus Python. So those are the minimal requirements you need to build, um, which are usually on, on all login nodes. They are usually available in some form or another. On Linux or Mac, you might have to install these things um, first, but also there, the basic installation is quite easy. And this runs through, usually without any problems. At the end, what you get are those ARC files you need to build CP2K itself. So it doesn't build CP2K by itself, but it gives some instructions so you can simply copy it over and then choose one of those versions. Usually you don't have to build all of them, but you can usually just pick one of those um, to build the desired version of CP2K um, to run it. Um, it automatically builds uh, libxc for uh, advanced uh, exchange correlation functionals, the libint uh, for, um, for uh, uh, hardy fock uh, integrals, the libxsmm, which is the small matrix multiplication library uh, now supported by, by Intel, but it also works on, on AMD uh, CPUs, so it makes sure that the small matrix multiplication um, operations use the fastest method available on your CPU automatically. Uh, it also builds ELPA, which needs additional configuration than in CP2K to, to use it. So it's not completely uh, automatic here, but it builds it. And also it builds the newly added uh, serious plane wave code. So you can do plane wave calculations within CP2K using this library. Of course, if you don't have a compiler or a supported compiler or MPI installation, you can also tell the toolchain to build everything. Um, be aware, on a cluster, this might not be such a good idea. The reason is that there you usually have um, a compiler and an MPI library which is supported and provided by the cluster administrators. And there you should make use of this MPI library to run on the cluster. But nevertheless, on a, on a local single node, you can use that to build everything you need and then build CP2K with that. And here, when you start building stuff yourself, uh, we use Fortran, which is um, kind of nice since, um, since it's around for a um, uh, couple of years now. So usually the compilers support it quite well. But what you have to be aware of that is that all the libraries, all the Fortran libraries must be built with the same compiler and also with the same version. Um, and this is another reason why you should be careful with that here. Uh, once you have an MPI version provided by your system and a compiler, you should try to use that one or then talk to your local um, supercomputer uh, experts to do that. Last but not least, um, even though Fortran is around for, for some time now, there are compilers which break CP2K, or let's put it the other way, CP2K breaks compilers and other libraries. This happens, uh, we are talking, we are in contact with uh, compiler developers um, or vendors to, to fix those issues, and they are actually using CP2K as a benchmark for their compiler. Um, before you start, and if you have a compiler, first head to this web page to see whether the compiler you're using uh, is actually supported or whether you might have to expect some issues there. Uh, another way, and I've been told this is, uh, well, you're using a different system here to do that. Um, another way could be um, this spec project, which does what the toolchain does, but in a more generic way. Um, if you're using the, the resources here, you might see also see the, the um, 
alternative to it, which is called uh, Easy Build. And with Spec or also Easy Build, it's usually quite easy if you have to build it yourself. Y here with Spec, it's you clone instead of CP2K, you clone Spec, um, you source it, and then you basically simply install CP2K. And then what it does, it again it downloads all the requirements you need using only the system's compiler. Uh, and then you can load CP2K as you would do with a module load command you're probably used to. And as I said, the only requirement is effectively Python. Everything else is being built. So it will take a bit longer than the toolchain script, um, but it will give you a reproducible build. And compared to the toolchain, it directly installs a version of CP2K. So usually the latest version they have, the latest release version. And from there, if you need then the latest CP2K version from Git, you can extract the, the ARC file from this installation and tailor it to your needs. And spec also allows you to easily change the configuration of the CP2K build. So you can here enable or disable features you might need. Um, which allows you to build CP2K without actually having ever to edit the ARC file. Now, if you need this ARC file, um, it's a bit hidden still in spec, but you can get it here. And you can use that to build your own version of, of CP2K or use it as a starting point. And as I said, the alternative you have is, of course, easy build, supported by the guys here. Now, once you have CP2K, um, there is a question about reproducibility. Um, as we've also seen, just building CP2K doesn't guarantee that CP2K really works due to the complexity of, of the build process and the required libraries, etc. Um, to verify the build you have, and this is what your um, supercomputer experts usually do, is they run tests provided with CP2K which give you this kind of output. So if you have built it yourself, you can run it. Here I have uh, the ASOPT version and a local ARC file. So this is, comes from the toolchain. And what you will see in this test is first, um, some features which are missing are being skipped. So it doesn't fail if you have not compiled with libint or libxc. It simply skips those issues. And in the end, you get a complete summary of which tests were were okay and which failed. And there are different numbers, uh, different um, ways on how they can fail. Either they can completely fail, which meant CP2K crashed during the execution of such a test, or you can get a wrong number. So we don't only check whether CP2K runs, but we also check that it is within some tolerance able to reproduce the, the numbers recorded in the test, for example, um, some energy or some occupation numbers, etc. Now the tests usually do not include long-running MD calculations, since they are long-running, and at some point you want to start your calculations and not wait for tests. Um, but it should give you, you should can be confident that when those tests run and you get the right results, that your CP2K ins installation should be sound and you should be able to get um, correct numbers out of it. Now, another um, thing is our dashboard. Um, we have uh, a number of different architectures. Um, we have a couple of clusters in there. Um, we have our own machines, um, different um, machines here, where we regularly run the CP2K tests suite. Um, so these rec tests and where we collected the information on this dashboard. And this dashboard not only shows you the current state of the latest version, but you can also, by going through the results here, you can get the ARC file which was used to produce this version of CP2K. So if you have a similar architecture, if you have to build it uh, on a similar machine, you can go there, look at it, and take that ARC file to get um, something which is supposed to be working also on your machine. And you also get the full logs and you can also compare timings, etc., to verify that what you have works. Now, once you have that, um, okay. 
once you have that, um, the question is how you run calculations. So when you get something like the, like the, the exercises we had here, um, then you usually have everything pre-made and it should work out of the box. But when you start uh, modifying the things, um, you might get some errors when submitting the things to the cluster. And here the strategy I recommend is get a local or an interactive version of CP2K. Um, here on this cluster you can run interactively the jobs, do that, and then start first testing your inputs with the check option, which should give you the basic checks so that you know, okay, uh, in principle it's okay. But as you could already mention on Monday, um, the checks are only basic, so it's basic syntax checks. So to avoid running for, I don't know, a um, couple of hours or days, and then running into a problem in the, in the post-processing of, of your calculation, um, we usually recommend to get these complex tests, basically, or a trial run done. Uh, we usually recommend to use, um, to reduce the number of steps. This can be reduce the number of max SCFs, so you don't um, expect your calculation to converge, um, or reduce the number of MD steps you do, just to be sure that your whole configuration actually works and you get it, uh, it will make it to the end without an error before actually running. And this you can usually do if you limit the max SCF, the max steps, and also, for example, um, set the outer SCFs to, to one, um, you should be able to run that on a, on a small machine just to get an impression whether it works or not. Now, when, do, when you do this, this kind of testing here, um, you might want to capture the output. Now, here I assume a bash shell, which is pretty much a standard everywhere, and capturing the output can be a bit tricky. This depends on whether or not you're running through MPI run or some other command. And they might capture or alter the way the output is being captured in files. So the only consistent way I found is basically this one here, if you run interactively. So pipe your output um, and also record it, because you might want to look at it later on or kind of like be able to browse through it. So this basically um, captures you both the standard output and the standard error. And this way you're usually able to capture all the errors, be it from CP2K or from the MPI libraries into one output file for analysis. And if you um, don't, if you can't, if you can't interpret the error and if you have to seek help, this is usually a good starting point to um, send those guys by, by mail or send to our uh, forum to, to <coughs> actually get help. Of course, production runs, you can then use the minus O flag for CP2K to capture only the output and leave the capturing of the, the error output, which is usually on a different uh, file descriptor, leave that to your batch system. Because the batch system usually provides you uh, with flags to actually capture errors and leave it to them and capture it separately. Do not try to kind of like do some fancy redirection of outputs and SDD errors here. Just. Okay. Um, are there any questions concerning that part? Otherwise, we will go to how you actually can generate your input. Yes. I have a question on the, on the testing. You were showing the output from the test suite, which runs in six minutes. Is that realistic? Yes. Is it because it's a serial build? Or yes, it's a serial build. So all everything related to parallel builds um, is uh, was skipped here. And um, also, I think this is also a stripped down build. So also a lot of the libraries are not tested and those respective test cases are skipped. But the, um, the test suite is actually tuned to run in a rather short time, even if you do in parallel and if, even if you have everything. So we really try to get the numbers down. So kind of like find the balance to get um, a good value that we have, can we that we can assure that everything works, but that we get um, a result in, in finite time. 
So actually. Some of the correct tests here would actually skip the tests. Or is that not the case? Would you see skip tests being counted separately? Or? Um, no, I don't think you will. I think those are those 3,000 tests you see here. But um, I mean, this was on, on one of our, of our uh, internal machines. So here you still had um, was it 48 CPUs available. It can actually run tests in parallel? Yes. Ah, okay. I didn't know that. Okay. So yeah, it scales up quite nicely. Okay, uh, data archival. There is another flag you might, you should be aware of, I think at least. Um, this is this echo flag you have on CP2K. Now CP2K has really a lot of options and you usually only set some of them. So that means a lot of options will get the default values um, the developers um, uh, decided on. And to archive your calculation and make sure that you can run it um, possibly with a newer version of, of CP2K where the defaults may have changed, I really recommend at some point to archive your whole input by running it with CP2K echo. This is this minus E flag here. And this will give you an input file where all the defaults are filled. So at this point you see what is it actually being done what you don't specify. So all the required options. And this is something I, in my calculations at least, I archive that together with the, with the calculation just to be sure, should the defaults change, um, that I can still run the calculation the same way. And uh, I can tell you if, if you change jobs or if you do it on a, on a different node and you get a different result, this gives you kind of like a safety so that you can say, well, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident that all my complete setup is the same as on the other node, so the error might be somewhere else. And since everything is, um, you have a lot of libraries involved, this can be uh, reduce the error finding time uh, considerably, having this kind of like a complete input. The other things you might have to archive um, at some point are the potential or the basis sets, even though we provide them with CP2K, um, I saw that some of you at least are putting together your own basis set and your own potentials file based on, on, on other libraries published. At that point you have to archive those such that you are able to, um, to reproduce your calculation at some point on a, on a different installation. Of course the structure files you specified and also for example force field parameters, dispersion corrected parameters, the DFDB files everything this, I would recommend at least at the end of your project to archive those, even though CP2K will be around and you can track the history, it's just um, a good idea to have those in store and to have a complete project here. Of course you also have the restart files. The restart file is nothing else than a, a complete input file again. Now what you have to know here is that you can specify the structures in a separate file. And this file, the content of this file, actually appears again as a CP2K input in this restart file. So when you run your calculation from a restart file and you had the uh, your uh, structure definition in a separate file, there might be a warning telling you, well, you have a coordinate section in there, but you also specify a file here and that this file is being ignored. So be aware when restarting calculations or when using a restart file to continue your calculations, you can't assume unless you remove those coordinate sections again from this restart file that your, um, that your input files here are used. I mean, there is a warning there and you see at the end of your calculation, you should check that the number of warnings is zero, but this can be easily be skipped this step. Then of course you have to archive your trajectories, your energy files, etc, etc, etc. What you usually can skip for MD calculations, I would say, um, are the wave functions. They can, those files can grow quite big at some point, depending on your system. So those you could probably skip 
on, on archival. And if you get something weird when, um, when running your calculation concerning your structure, for example, CP2K is, is quite tolerant when it comes to specifying your input file. So even though you have your check and you do, uh, and it loads the files correctly, there might be a syntax error which could possibly lead to um, strange effects, for example, for uh, cell sizes, etc. One of those examples is when using a comma instead of a dot as a delimiter in, in de uh, as a decimal point. And at that point, uh, CP2K interprets that as two numbers instead of a one comma zero, uh, or so one comma one, for example. And running this echo uh, command also allows you to check what CP2K in the end, after running everything else, actually sees and what uh, it acts on. Okay, now how do you get your inputs? I mean, here you had your exercises um, which provided the inputs and some of you already experienced and <laughs> don't need that. So the first thing is probably use your favorite molecule structure editor to get your structure. Quite easy. Um, CP2K supports XYZ uh, files. Here um, one has to note that it mm -hmm. supports it only as for loading coordinates. So connectivity information which might be present is gets ignored. So it's not the same as, for example, the internal cords section where you can specify connectivity. If you need that, you have to go to PDB or SIF files. From there, connectivity information should be parsed and, and available inside. And as a reminder again, the restart files um, contain the, in the, the coordinates parsed in those files as in the cord section. There are other ways to get an initial input file for CP2K. One is uh, the plugins for Avogadro. So for Avogadro 1 and 2, there are each uh, CP2K plugins. Unfortunately, they are not maintained anymore, as it seems, even though um, the authors of Avogadro would like to make a release 1.3. And they um, plan to include the CP2K plugin um, as part of the Avogadro 1.3 release but it's not yet said when this is going to happen. So nevertheless, this might give, if you're already used to those programs, and for Avogadro 1, you can simply download the binaries the author provide here uh, and plug the, the plugins in. So you can um, use that for scaffolding input files for CP2K. Uh, a more active project is the Chimera uh, molecular editor uh, here. And I think I already saw some of you using that as a tool. Uh, there are so there are some projects called Teeter and Lef00. Um, they can be used to generate input for CP2K. So those are common line tools which run on Linux. So they don't run on Windows, unfortunately. But if you happen to run on Linux um, and you are using Chimera, there is a plugin for Chimera which allows you to easily take the coordinates from Chimera, export them into Teeter or Left00 and have this kind of like um, menu guided interface here inside Chimera to get from the structures from Chimera to a CP2K input file here. And Teeter and Left00 are quite um, powerful in what kind of analysis they can do, for example, here. Um, and of course, they can bring the whole analysis back to Chimera as well. Now, the projects which are more supported or which are more actively developed, so um, Left00 is getting a rewrite, um, as, I, as I heard. So they are supported and Chimera, of course. Um, but what's even more active are the command line tools to generate CP2K input. One of those is this PyCP2K. So instead of um, CP2K input, you write Python code. And they have this nice interface which resembles 
which is close to the CP2K input uh, format and, and the syntax, but using Python. And with that, you can either run um, calculations directly, again, or generate an input file using Python scripts, which might help if you already have a workflow and you're generating um, new structures or, or things with Python, then this might be worthwhile to look into, such that you don't have to generate input files by hand, but that you can use um, directly Python to generate those. Uh, of course, you have the Python ASE, which has an interface to CP2K. Um, you can not only use it to generate the structures, you can then export to a format supported by CP2K, but you can also directly run CP2K as a shell uh, from Python ASE. The advantage of that is that you can easily run multiple calculations without um, the startup time, the startup overhead of CP2K, which it makes it quite interesting for small kind of like parameter searches you can run locally. You can also run, it can also run uh, CP2K on a remote machine using SSH, but currently this um, the easy setup is limited to running things interactively. So whether or not it's available on, on your cluster depends on whether they have set it up or not. And also here you have directly your CP2K input. You can merge into what ASE is generating for CP2K, which makes it um, nice to have this kind of like templating where you use your default uh, parameters and then just use ASE to fill up the rest, for example, the structures. Then we also have um, facilities built in to CP2K. Um, this is the CP2K uh, internal input preprocessor, which was already mentioned on Monday. Um, this runs before CP2K actually starts running, so really at the beginning. And the <coughs> commands are rather limited, but it is enough to get um, to get to make high throughput calculations easier. So one is you can include snippets of code or snippets of CP2K input files here. You can set and use variables, which makes it easy to parameterize some sections. Uh, one example would be that um, some, um, some molecules you are testing maybe need, need uh, GAPW uh, instead of just GPW. So we want to switch between all electron calculations and non-all electron calculations. So you could basically use the same input file and just uh, protect the respective sections with this if and if and then use, for example, in the files included, set the corresponding variables to enable the different sections. Uh, if you want to do that, the print command is quite nice to figure out which sections were now actually used. Um, for example, for a high throughput project, this could look like this. So you could have here a base input file, which has this include settings input here. And those includes are al always respective to where CP2K runs. So if you have multiple structures here, you could have the structure here, um, which you would like to run, plus the settings for that structure. And then you would go into that directory and then simply start CP2K and pass it this input file here. And since it takes those includes relative to where you started it, it will pick up this settings file here, which makes it quite easy to have one template and then run the same template for a different structure. And those settings, those included files can of course contain either um, another set command to enable disable certain sections or also include other include files. And since this can be can become quite complex. I've seen uh, projects where they do this over five levels, and in the end, it gets difficult to know okay, which which files were now actually used and which sections were uh, now activated um, using this. Again, use the CP2K echo command to get a full input, so you see what is actually being used there, and make it easier for you yourself later on archive those complete input files at some point. Okay, um, are there any questions concerning that? 
good. <laughs> then I will continue with um, how you run calculations. Usually if you have simple MDs, which take a long, long time to run, you have a batch script you run, you submit it to the cluster and then you simply wait. Then you have your restart file and if it terminates uh, due to, to, all, to the all time, you simply submit that again. And then you use the cluster's tools. Usually you can also in your cluster, you can have jobs which depend on each other and implement cycles there. You do that until your MD is actually done and you have all the steps you need. If you do parameter searches or kind of like high throughput calculations, um, there are other ways. And one problem, so, um, usually when doing this run automation, we have on one hand all this batch processing here, and here you have the scheduler assisted thing, the shell scripts you probably know. You can also, as you've seen, script everything with Python here. And what I would like to show you are the facilities provided with CP2K, which is this CP2K farming. On the other hand, if you then have complex workflows, so CP2K is not the only tool you're running or you have to run it multiple times and pass along input, then you have this kind of like workflows and there are also some tools to automate this. So when you have small calculations and you run them on a large number of nodes, the startup time you have, which initializes MPI and shows communication between the nodes might not be negligible. We see that when you run rec tests on, on, our, uh, on a cluster, uh, but you might also see that when you have small molecules and do a lot of them. And what you can do here is you can use the CP2K farming, which allows you to start CP2K once and then let CP2K run different small jobs on that cluster. And this is quite easy. The run type here is none. You have here a farming section. Here you specify the jobs you want to run. And inside here, you specify your original input files. This can be, for example, the ones you saw before from this high throughput calculation. Um, CP2K parses them as it would parse a normal calculation. Difference being here is you have only one CP2K instance which starts and then it schedules these jobs and runs this on the cluster. So if you reserve 20 nodes, you can do a subdivision, you can do groups of, of, uh, of tasks, and you can say, okay, uh, I take 10 nodes for, for doing uh, some jobs here, one after each other, and the other 10 nodes for something else. And you start CP2K only once. And of course, CP2K also allows to um, specify dependencies between these jobs if that is needed. And of course, also this kind of like master slave algorithm where you load balance the jobs over the nodes you have, depending on the configuration. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I would recommend the documentation on that for on the CP2K input. And this is really useful for when running multiple small jobs. And that when startup time or getting into the queue, it's also kind of like a way to cheat the queuing system a bit once you are in the queue to run multiple jobs which, depending on the policy there, might not be acceptable. But yeah, it still can be very useful. Now, on the workflow side, there are multiple projects. One is the, the one I mentioned before, which I'm not going to mention it further, is uh, the automate uh, thing, which is based on or coming from the PyMatGen uh, people. Um, you might have used those projects uh, already. So they have also this kind of like automation framework. Uh, the one I'm proposing here is the one we developed uh, in, in Switzerland inside this NCCR Mar Marvel project, which is called AIDA. And the strong focus for AIDA is this data prominence. Data prominence means that at any time you can, for every calculation, see where are my basis sets coming, where are my potentials coming, where are my structures coming, because usually you get, the, you get them from somewhere. So inside, if you run your calculations through this AIDA, um, you will see afterwards exactly, okay, here I did the geometry optimization, then from this geometry optimization, I did a phonon calculation, and maybe I did um, some, some MD afterwards uh, with what I had there. The setup, although, is a bit more complicated than, for example, with Python ASE or the other batch 
um, job-based things, since it requires a database to store that. And it also archives all your artifacts, so all your output files, etc. But you have, in the end, you have this advanced workflow engine, which is on top of Python, so it's not a separate uh, language you have to learn, but you can use Python to actually incorporate other jobs, other um, tasks inside your workflow. It has a plugin architecture, so CP2K um, is supported as a plugin. It also has a VASP plugin, since I heard that you're doing a lot of VASP, so there you can also mix and match uh, different codes and exchange data between them through these workflows. They also have this true Python notebook integration. If you're interested in that, I really recommend the virtual machine image they have, where you can try that out. And they also have, for example, an interactive thing, where um, this was developed uh, at EMPA in Switzerland, where you can easily in a notebook um, investigate different uh, carbon nanostructures. And of course, since it's all about open science and open data, it integrates well with the Materials Cloud open science platform and allows you to export data there. Might not be that interesting for you, um, but still um, to mention. As an example, um, how that could look like, it's similar to ESC, it's also Python based. So what you do here is this is an example script for, for one of those um, AIDA scripts and how to run a calculation through AIDA. Um, so first you have a calculation object, so you have a code, which you have to configure at, at the beginning. Then you build your structure. This can be either a structure is already present in the database, from a previous calculation maybe, or the, from an import you did. Um, you have the structure, then you have parameters going into the calculation, Again, you see here the CP2K input format, this time in a JSON uh, style format. Then you configure um, your resources, and in the end you submit it. And AIDA runs on your local computer, and if you have configured it correctly, it connects to the cluster, runs the calculation there, waits until it's finished, and then fetches everything you need back to your local computer. So all this manual copying there, fetching data back, it all, uh, all does that automatically. And as I said, data provenance is important here. So what you get by um, setting all these things up here in this way is this kind of graph. So at the end, you can show how exactly you obtained your results by simply going back in this graph. So every calculation you do, every input you did, um, is a node in this graph and allows you to browse it. It makes it possible to figure out after, even after a couple of years, how you obtained the results. Are there any questions concerning these workflows at the moment? Good. Um, a number of projects were already mentioned. I will mention some of one of those again, plus some other two. Um, as said, CP2K can't possibly do everything you might uh, have to do uh, in your career with CP2K. Um, so there are projects, and we are also working with those projects to support CP2K. There, uh, one of those is uh, Phonopy, which you can use to do phonon calculations. Uh, again, it's a Python-based tool. It uses CP2K, well, it doesn't use CP2K directly, but it generates, it uses a supercell approach to do phono calculations. So what it requires from you is a CP2K input file with a basic input uh, with your structure where you want to do the phono calculations for. And from that, it generates, you run it twice. Uh, once it generates you this set of supercells, then you are supposed to run CP2K on all these um, supercells here. And in the end, you run Phonopy again to calculate the phonons based on the energies and forces calculated on those supercells it generated for you. 
And now you see why this kind of like workflow tools might get useful. Because if you have to do that a number of times for different structures, it might become tedious. So um, the idea here could be either use scripted or use one of the workflow tools to automate this. Then on the other hand, we heard that when you do this kind of transition pass sampling that you might have troubles in sampling uh, rare events. There's a project which um, tries to accelerate this. This is called Pyretis. Um, you might already know that they also support WASP, um, but they also support CP2K, and this is what I'm interested here. So here it works different. Pyretis calls CP2K on your behalf. So you have to provide CP2K input plus Pyretis configuration and then run it and it automatically calls CP2K and again and again until you get what you need. So it uses uh, CP2K as an integrator for the MD steps it does there. Then IPy was mentioned. Um, the interface here to CP2K is different and the setup might depend on your local supercomputer computing center. So here I would recommend to talk to them. The reason is that you have to start CP2K separately and CP2K has to support these sockets. So there must be some extra network communication between the IPy process and CP2K. The advantage here is that you can reserve a couple of nodes for CP2K and some, well, usually only a few for IPy here and IPy communicates with the sockets interface with a long-running CP2K process. So if you have to do that, I would suggest to look at examples and then talk to your support team if you're not running it locally. And um, the IPy, especially in version 2, they extended now the, the methods they support here. So they not, they're not doing only doing path integral um, molecular dynamics here, but they have also many additional methods available, including also geometry optimization. So if you're a heavy user of IPy, uh, it might be worthwhile, even though uh, we will probably recommend still to do this kind of like jobs with CP2K, but it might be worthwhile to look at the other methods um, IPy supports to uh, make your workflow easier at that point. And of course, there are a lot of other projects supporting CP2K in one way or another. Um, there are too many to, to mention here, so these uh, three examples should give you some ideas on, on what you can do there. Then we heard um, that basis set selection, so we have basis sets and they play an important role in your calculations. So the question is there, in the exercises you had some basis sets already pre-selected or recommended and you heard um, for, um, from Matt, you heard um, which ones to use for um, ADMM. And the question is here, for doing proper calculations at some point you should also do a convergence analysis on basis sets in principle. The problem being that um, you might not have enough sizes of basis sets available to actually get this kind of a convergence results you need. And the question is here what to do and there's this, this kind of challenge and there were uh, two years ago, almost two years ago, there was um, this paper here which suggested that um, basis sets for Gaussian type orbital codes were insufficient to even reach or standard uh, basis sets were even uh, insufficient to reach chemical accuracy. So the authors here claimed that to actually get this chemical accuracy you have to go to really large basis sets and the question is here is that really true and uh, there were some shortcomings in that paper and there was this this explanation of that later on kind of like um, a counter to it and it says no you don't need those large basis sets to actually actually get this kind of like precision or accuracy uh, but you have just to choose the right ones and uh, here you have to make sure that when you're doing DFT 
you're actually using basis sets optimized for DFD calculations and not something else. Because here they used um, basis sets which were um, optimized for wave function correlated methods and um, of course they gave wrong re results or bad results when using them with DFT. The question is now, you as a user, how can you judge whether you have the right basis set or not? Um, one thing I recommend is get a paper which does a similar thing as you do and read the specification on what the author do there. And the other thing we are now working on is systematically benchmark our basis sets we have against different benchmarks to make sure that you have a selection of basis sets and corresponding reference calculation, kind of like as a guideline on which um, basis sets to choose. The one of those benchmarks here, um, which was, yeah, was um, spearheaded, uh, I would say, uh, the university here even, and is this uh, Delta test. It's a solid state benchmark. Uh, it works on comparing basically the energy volume curve for different materials, for different uh, elemental crystals between the different coats. And with that, they compared a large number of methods or a large number of coats and they implemented methods there. Um, the coats they mostly used were all actions codes as a reference, of course, because pseudization as you heard, introduces some error. So all electrons codes will be more precise, but obviously more costly. Um, so they use those as, uh, as a reference, but also they also showed that with pseudopotentials, you can reach um, very good accuracy and agreement with other codes. So CP2K is not there yet, present on this list, but I can show you some of the results here. Um, I guess you will probably want to browse that on, on your computer if you are interested in, in that. What you can see here, what is important is that we actually have also for a solid state benchmark, we see that when we go to larger basis sets, we are coming to into closer agreement with, um, with existing codes. So the bars here in the background are the results or the difference between up in it, uh, plane wave code, using pseudopotentials and uh, CP2K using the same pseudopotential. So what you see here is that we actually get into the same range as a plane wave code here with, with pseudization. And what you also see here in the background is a result, a comparison of CP2K and an all electron code. Um, from here, what you can get, a, uh, get is that in some extent we are with the basis set compensating for the error done by the pseudopotential. And this was test was done with the MOLOPT basis set we have, which as the name says and was already mentioned, optimized for molecular calculations, but it also works very well for solid state calculations. And um, at least for most molecule, uh, for, for most elements, you've seen that some of those are quite hard to get right, and some of the data is still missing. But we are also working on benchmarking the all-electron painting a basis set, which was requested um, not too long ago, also on the, on the mailing list. And of course, we are also working on more benchmarks to give you as a user uh, a good idea on which basis set um, to choose for your individual project. We will finally this year publish this data on the materialscloud.org. Since this is part of the NCCML Marvel project, we'll publish it there. But there you will have a discovery section where you can look at the different benchmarks and the re uh, relevant data. And mm -hmm. if you need solid state calculations, what you can directly take away from here is if you do solid state calculations, you probably want to use, at least to get your final results, the triple theta MOLOPT basis set with CP2K. That's that. At some point, you have to be able to show that your code scales, and this really depends on your project, as you already heard. So there are a couple of, of um, things you can do to get 
the relevant numbers or to figure out where the bottleneck in, in your calculation is. You heard the theory on Monday. Now this theory is reflected here in this timing output. So if you run the CP2K calculation at the end, you have these timing sections, which gives you an idea on which functions used how much of the time. And here you have for the functions, you have the relevant keywords of the different methods. So PW stands for plane wave part, FFT stands for fast Fourier transformation, MP stands for message passing, so MPI and communication, and something like write, of course, corresponds to a write function. So if you now go and check your timing and you, for example, see that a write function takes one third of the time, then the question you probably have to ask is, do I really need to write? So what I'm writing here and do I need to write this much data and are you writing on the right share? Because supercomputing centers usually provide different shares or different folders and not all of them are equally fast or suited for this kind of like data. Um, with this ASD value here, this gives you an idea on, on how deeply nested it is. The explanation here, how many times it's called, is kind of obvious. And uh, also the self-time is important. So the average time here on the right is the total time for that function, including all the subcalls it does. And this time here gives you um, the value on how much was spent in this function alone without the functions which were separately tracked. And with that, you should get a quite good picture if you go back to the theory and compare your input on which methods might take the most time in your calculation and whether or not you can do anything at all here. So the guidelines for interpreting this output is make sure that the I.O. doesn't consume more than 50% of the time. Even 50% is, is quite a high number. And at that point, not every system scales to your whole cluster. It's kind of logical, but still, um, you might flatten here eventually. Even though you might have a faster time to solution, you might be wasting node hours there. Depending on, on how you have to pay or how somebody has to pay for the budget you get, um, be careful when scaling CP2K up and check the numbers here for different example systems. So how to get an example system? Again, reduce the number of SCF cycles, reduce the number of MSD steps, do that shortly to get the numbers before you run the full benchmark or the, the full uh, simulation. And as I said, when you have I.O. routines, check whether you really need this, this high resolution of steps in here, etc. Also compare the average and maximum values you have in there, because if the maximum value is much larger than the average value, this probably means that one of your jobs is waiting, uh, no, one of your jobs is blocking the calculation and all the other nodes are basically running empty or are much faster in that routine. So you might have a problem there, usually, uh, again, related to I.O. or writing. And then, of course, um, the biggest gain are the algorithmic gains here. So the biggest gain is by, by doing a proper setup. So choose the cell size wisely. Don't make it too big, etc. cetera. Um, check the SCF settings, check the preconditioner that can be really tremendous differences in speed. You already heard that, for example, for the OT method. Also choose the basis set wisely. So um, for molecule calculations, you might go to a double theta uh, basis set. For a solid state, you might rather use a, more bigger, a bigger one. You can also use ADMM to speed everything up here um, and doing hybrid calculations, etc., etc., etc. You heard that from the other speakers. And there is no, unfortunately, no universal recipe on how to tune the calculation, but it is really system dependent. And um, as I said, limit the number of steps to get just the number to start. And when compiling yourself, um, make sure if 
it's applied if you have an Intel compiler and if you have the MKL or if you are on a Cray system, use the vendor supplied BLAST, LAPAC and Fast Fourier transformation libraries because they are usually very optimized. And a lot of time is usually spent, if you already check this, is usually spent in those libraries. Use libxsmm, which is by now the default. Possibly also go and investigate on how to use ELPA uh, to speed up. And also CUDA is available um, now also for the matrix multiplication, depending on what you're doing. And here we are working on that actively, and the next release will see also some improvements in the CUDA part. And since this is the last talk, um, where to go from here, once we are not here and once you can't ask questions anymore, um, where to get help, start with our wiki page. There are a lot of exercises, lecture slides you can look at, um, also papers mentioned, which will also mention uh, the parameters being used. So this is a good starting point. The input file reference, again, is the manual cp2k.org. Make sure you select the right version because newer versions might have a slightly different um, input section. For example, for the libxc uh, section, this changed recently for 6.1 compared to the 5.1. And if you need for certain calculations, minimal working examples, the tests, the rec tests I've recommended to run when compiling your own CP2K version, they also can serve as a minimal working example um, to actually get a calculation started or to check on how to set it up. So go in there, they are usually quite good categorized by different uh, sections you have and look at those examples. Last but not least, we have a Google group, a forum where you can ask questions. This is usually quite active and you, most of the time you can expect an answer within a day or two. Um, but yes, um, you can expect that, but uh, provided that you give us enough background information on your system. Again, I showed how to get the output. You might have to paste everything there um, for that. I don't know whether it's a problem, whether you have to keep things um, secret or not, but if you can speak openly about it, this is probably the right way to get help. Um, if you have an issue. And then, should that happen, if you find a bug in CP2K or you suspect one, um, we are on GitHub where we manage uh, the source code and there is the issues um, tab where you can report any issues you found and we will try to fix those. That was about it. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> and if there are any more questions, I'm here. Any more questions before we wrap it up? <coughs> <laughs>